Hi, I'm Stacey and welcome back to my YouTube channel. And in this video, I'm going to be going over my full test bench from start to finish. It's easy to start with the simulator and just be like, oh, I have a simulation tool. I'll use that. But the thing is, is that you can't just sit there with your calculator calculating for every clock cycle. Oh, I must do this. Oh, I must do that. It's just not feasible. <laughs> if you have a hundred meg clock, then that's a hundred million clock cycles that you have to verify are working. And that's really hard to do manually by visually checking the waveform. So that's why I use Python in conjunction with my test bench to generate input files to test and pass the output files so that everything is done writing to file and reading from file. And that way I can make sure that I'm putting a stimulus into my test bench that's useful and that what's coming out of my test bench is right. And we can do that for millions and millions of clock cycles, however long you have to simulate for. And that's a way more comprehensive method of testing stuff. So I'm going to show you what that consists of today. Hi everyone, Editing Stacy here. This is specifically for data streams. So if you're testing like an Axie interface, then this isn't going to work for that. This is specifically for like sensor data on a dashboard or a data stream or something where you have like a bunch of data coming in. There are other verification methodologies for like an Axie stream or an interface or handshaking. Just to let you know, I mentioned it at the end of the video, but I thought I should mention it at the start as well. Cool. Bye. Let us start with my Verilog, system Verilog for reading and writing. So this is the system Verilog code that reads from file. And after this, I will show you how I make the file that it reads. We just have a module, it's system Verilog module. And I just have two outputs here, a sign data and a valid. And over here, we can put in the file name as a parameter. And I can also specify the length of the word that I'm going to be writing out and the fact that it's signed is quite important. This initial begin block is simulation only. It's not a synthesizable construct. Initial blocks are not synthesizable in general. There are some cases where some tools like Xilinx tools can sometimes synthesize initial blocks, but in general, they're not synthesizable. An initial block is basically just run at the beginning initially. And then once it's finished running, it will stop. It's not like an always block, which is synthesizable. And that will run uh, on an event like a clock or a signal change. So in this initial block, I am just opening the file. So basically, this is the spot where I open the file. I want to open it at the beginning of the simulation. So at the beginning of the simulation, I try and open the file. And I check if the file is open and finish the simulation if it's not. So this is just a little error check to make sure that the file is open. And then in this initial block, the file is open now. I set up my signal values and then I wait until reset, and until I'm out of reset. And then this is a while loop that just loops until the end of the file is reached. So this condition just checks that I've got to the end of the file. And this is also not synthesizable. And it, while I'm not at the end of the file, it will scan through the file line by line for this particular format. So this is very like C-like. Scanf is a C thing as well. It uses very similar syntax to what you would expect in C. And it's basically scan the file handle, which was defined up here then the string that you are interested in, and then the signal that you want to put that data in. So I want to put the contents of this file line by line. So it'll be the line in this file with this format goes into this variable or this logic signal. And then I assert valid high. And then this means wait for the next clock cycle. So on the next clock cycle, I do it again. And that's basically it. That's reading from my file until the file is done. And when the file's done, then this while loop will end and then this initial block will be done. And that way I can produce input stimulus from file for my simulation. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is we need to create the file that this simulation is going to use. So I'm going to go over to the Python code in this project. Here's my gen stimulus.py. This is the Python code that I used to generate the input stimulus for my simulation. I have a sample rate of three meg, a frequency of one K. So this is my input frequency and I'm aiming for frequencies below three K. Cause I think that's like the voice speaking range is below three K and then N is the number of samples. So this is how many samples I'm going to be putting in my file. And then this is the sinusoid. 
So basically, the cosine function for numpy is in radians. And the way I think of it is I think of it as a ratio of a circle. So fs is the circle, and f0 is a slice of the pie that I want. And so I have a specific ratio, a slice of my circle pie, um, and I need to scale that ratio. So f0 over S fs is the important ratio. It doesn't really matter what f0 and fs are. When you're creating a sinusoid, you just want the ratio between f0 and fs. And I have that ratio, and then I need to scale it to be radian. So my circle is 2 pi radians. And so I need to scale my ratio to be radians, which is why I take my ratio, which is f0 over fs. So it would be 1 if it was fs over fs, but that would not meet Nyquist. So that's not a good <laughs> value to pick. It has to be, f0 has to be less than half. And then I scale it to be my full circle. And then I'm just using numpy.a range from 0 to n, which will just get me all the, the samples that I need. And then I do the cosine of that. And so this way I can make a sinusoid of any frequency and it will be end long. And then I'm calculating the cosine. I'm shifting it up by one because the entire sinusoid needs to be positive. And that's because I'm putting it into a PDM generator that is going to produce PDM output. So this for loop is a PDM generator. So the cosine is usually between minus one and one. I'm shifting it up. So I'm making it between zero and two. And this is like a PDM generator. So here's PDM on Wikipedia. It's basically pulse density modulation. And it basically takes a sinusoid like this or any audio signal and turns it into ones and zeros like this. And basically, the higher the audio signal in amplitude, the closer together the uh, one values are. Blue is one and white is zero. And then as the amplitude goes down, it kind of alternates between high and low. And then when the amplitude is low, the it's all zeros again. The way that this is converted is using delta sigma modulation. And so this is the process that I went through that I've done in my Python code. It integrates the signal, which is the area under the sinusoid. When it hits the threshold, it resets. And this impulse is just a reset which subtracts a value from it to reset it back down again. So you can see here it sums up and then it resets down, creates the sawtooth effect. I'm doing a for loop iterating through all my stimulus signals and then I keep a running sum which is my sum plus my sample. If the running sum is bigger than the threshold then the sum is reduced by the impulse, it resets back down and my output is high and by default the output is low because I initialize with a bunch of zeros so I just need to do the high version because the low version is there by default and my threshold and my impulse are specified here according to my input stimulus and that's basically that then what I do is I write that to file so every time every sample I write to file either one or zero and that is the stimulus file. Just a whole bunch of ones and zeros. There you go. And that stimulus file is the file that I use. So I copy that file into for Vado. It has to be copied into sim simulation behavioral exim. So it lives here. And there it is, PDM stimulus. So I have to copy it into here in order for it to be passed by the simulation tool. This is where the simulation tool is going to be looking for this file. So I've got my Python code writing to the file and I have my Verilog, my system Verilog code reading from the file and now that data is going to go into my simulation. So here's my simulation and we can see here this is this M data signal is the signal that's read from file. Oh let me just show you my test bench. Uh, this is not my test bench. So here's my test bench. And this is my read stimulus file. And I just basically put I put in the stimulus file name here. And this is why I said I have to copy it into the simulation directory is because when I put the file name here, if it's a relative path, it's going to look in that directory. So it's a little bit annoying. There is a way to put in a path where it references another folder, but I'm not going to do that now. 
and then the length is one bit because it's either a one or a zero and then I basically just hook it up to the signal that I want and that goes into my test bench. And then here's my simulation and we can see the signal, PDM signal. And it's pretty clear, like the, see the sinusoid. So there it's all high and then it's alternating up and down and then there it goes low again. And then it's alternating up and down and then there it goes high again and so on and so forth. So this is really cool because now I can Instead of generating random numbers, I can actually generate input signals that I can use for my test bench. And then over here, you can see this is where my file ran out. That's when my file ended. And then this is the output of my CIC. So we can see here this, this sinusoid shape of the CIC. We can actually do this radix signed and waveform analog. And then it'll give us, so that there we can see our nice sinusoid, which is the sinusoid that I generated. So if we go and run my Python code, three gen stimulus, we can see this is what our sinusoid looks like. And if we zoom in here, we can see there's our my up and down. That was what my Python code generated. And we can see the same thing in my test bench. There you go. So there is the sinusoid from my test bench and there is the waveform. So that's pretty cool. It's cool to be able to see the sinusoid in correct there. I've run my simulation and now I have a log file out. So quite a few videos ago, I made a video on saving to file, which is not in here. Here we go, log data. So this saves to file and I actually made a whole video about this one as well. And so when my simulation is done, I, I copy my files out of the simulation folder because they'll also be in that same folder. And I can run this Python code, which will read those files. So then I have a testbench.py. And if I run, let me just close this figure. If I run my testbench.py, there we go. So now this is my FFT of those signals. And we can see that they're landing on 1K. And there is my 1K and it lines up there. I'm going to show you how I plot this. If I head over to testbench.py, this is how I plot this. And basically I open the log files. So the log files were produced. So this is now the output. So I've put, I've written the stimulus in Python. I've put it into file. I've put it through my test bench. My test bench has written out to file using this module. And then now I'm, passing those files using this Python code. So this is the log file. These are the log files. And then I append the, I pass the files. I basically iterate through them and split by comma because it's comma separated. And then I do an FFT on the data. So my FFT is 512 big and my sample rate is three meg divided by 64. So because I have a CIC in this and the CIC is decimating by 64, my sample rate is not the same. So if we look here, in my gene stimulus, my FS is 3E6. In my test bench, which is the passing the output, my FS is 3E6 divided by 64 because I'm decimating by 64 on the FPGA. I'm using a handing window here quickly. It's just a simple general purpose window. Windowing just makes the FFT look nicer because basically in the time domain, if you just have a rectangle wave, it ends up being a sync function. So it looks really wavy. It's got all these horrible side lobes. It's basically really horrible. If you do an FFT of a rectangle, it's just, it works out badly. So by using a window, it kind of smooths off the edges nicely and that just minimizes the sync function effect. So I'm basically taking a chunk of my, win my data, multiplying it by my window, doing an FFT on it, doing the absolute value of that FFT because the output of an FFT is complex. It's got a real part and imaginary part. So it's like a vector with magnitude and direction. And we want the absolute value of that data, which is the length of the vector. So it's the magnitude part of the magnitude and direction. And then we do an FFT shift because if you don't have an FFT shift, then the DC ends up on the outside. It looks a bit weird. You've got DC on the ends and 
the high frequencies in the middle. And typically when you're viewing an FFT, you want it the opposite where you want the DC in the middle and the high frequencies on the outside. So the FFT shift just rotates it around. And then this is my X data, which is just my X axis, which basically just gives me the actual frequency along here where you can see DC is there in the middle and then we've got FS over 2 and FS over 2 on either side and that just allows us to get the right frequency. And then we plot it, the X data and the FFT data. And what's nice about this as well is that you can write Python code to reproduce what you're going to be doing on the FPGA. So if you have a pipeline, a signal processing pipeline, and you've got like a CIC and a filter and everything, then you can do that in Python and then do it on the FPGA as well. And then compare what does the Python output look like versus what does the FPGA output look like. And what's nice about that is that then I can check that the FPGA is doing the right thing. And I can also prototype in Python. So then if I want to be like, oh, but I want to try and use this filter instead of that filter, then I can do it in Python, check that it gets the results that I want, and then go to the effort of taking that filter and putting it on the FPGA. So there's a nice way of prototyping stuff for the FPGA in Python or in MATLAB or whatever language you choose. Uh, and so that's a really cool way of dealing with this and then you can use those python results and then you can look at the fpga log file and do and compare there's actually a thing called coco tb and coco tb is this but streamlined so i've used it before where basically instead of saving to file and then running the simulation with coco tb you can inject into the simulation itself. So it kind of like integrates itself into the simulator and then runs the simulation and does the handling of the files in the background. So you just write Python code and you just in your Python code, you say the signal must have this value and the signal must have this value. And then it does the simulation. You can on the fly in Python, check that the signals are the same. So the CocoTB is a really, really nice and it's open source. Uh, maybe what wonder if it's a good idea to convert this to open Coco TB. Coco TB is open source. It's great, but it does require some setup if you're using a free simulator. So when I was using it last, I think I ended up using Docker with ModelSim. Oh yes, it was Docker with ModelSim. It wasn't even this simulator. I was using uh, Altera tools. I wasn't using Xilinx. Okay, I don't know how to do it with Xilinx. Maybe I'll look into it and see. If anyone knows, if you can do Coco TP to Coco TB with the Xilinx simulator. So that is how I do this. And there are ways of automating it. You can like run scripts that will like copy the files and everything. So this is the process that I usually use. The only thing that I'll say is this method works really well for data pipelines. So if you have a stream of data like image data or RF signals or some kind of like data stream ADC. So anything like a DAC board that's like got a data stream coming in that's like a pipeline of data processing. That's where this works. This method doesn't work really that well with Axie interfaces and interfaces where you have handshaking. You can't really test the interface. You can't really test the handshaking. Um, you can sort of if you set it up, but this method doesn't really work so well with testing interfaces. Like if you have an Axie interface and you've got signals talking to each other back and forth, like ready and valids and stuff, it's difficult to use this method to test that stuff because you need to cover all your cases. And this isn't really the best way. You can't really do that with this. So this is really more suited to like a data pipeline where you have just a stream of data coming in that you're processing versus working with the Axie interface or something like that. So thanks everyone. Bye.